Here's one that people talk about all the time. Damnation. Every story that has ever been written on any sort of terrible monster or demon at some point gets to the true cause of horror. Eternal damnation. Whether it be dragging you into a realm like hell, purgatory, limbo, or just states of being that mimic these mythological realms, that is where the fear of such entities come from. You'll notice that the monsters that gave you the most vivid nightmares were not the ones who merely caused you physical harm. No, it was the ones that could make your eternal existence one of unbearable torment. And almost every great religion has a concept of this. Mortal beings though you are, you have somehow found a way to come up with a rudimentary understanding of infinity. And to the baser individual who isn't capable of piecing together a thought process without heavy reference to some dusty old book, that's all they need to know. Infinite happiness or infinite sadness. Well, obviously one is better than the other. Who wouldn't want to be eternally happy? These are the fools who honestly believe that winning the lottery would suddenly give their lives purpose. Why do they refuse to accept the basic reality of life? What makes our existence worthwhile are the peaks and troughs, both light and darkness, and each in their own manner and timing. He knows this. He understands better than we do. Heaven is not a place of everlasting joy. It's a place where we are ascended beings, those who are put through new and better trials to continue to improve ourselves. We have new challenges, yes, but the rewards are far greater the second, third, or hundredth time around. It's not quite reincarnation, more a continued progression. You might consider this mortal existence as a prologue to the real deal. I wouldn't know the precise details. I was the first to fail the test. Yeah, go ahead and put on that Rolling Stone song. It's one of those stories. I am, quite frankly, a little disturbed at how I'm being portrayed on sites like this. I don't mind the brilliant and cunning aspect, but the bouts of sudden violence and malignancy for malignancy's sake part, I find quite misinformed. Also, I am not the father of all lies. He created truth, and therefore lies, just as he created light, and therefore darkness. I was merely the first in a long line of pioneers who sought another way. Unfortunately for us, there wasn't one. Not that I am displeased with my current role. I continue to try and gain followers in the hopes that he will understand how unfair his first proposition was, how immoral it was, to place somebody like myself in a position to take power and then rip it away from my hands prematurely. But I digress. This isn't a story about me, this is a story about hell. Why should I tell a cautionary tale? Because it doesn't matter. No matter what hell has ever been described as, it hasn't ever been enough to stop sinners from sinning. No ghoul or monster will stop the lustful from their lascivious deeds. No punishment keeps the wrathful from harming their victims. No torment on heaven or on earth is enough to stop the greedy from taking from everyone. All I am doing is something that he didn't. I'm being fair and warning you properly. What's in store for you should you elect to find another way? Forget fire and brimstone. Hell is not so unoriginal. Pain really is not an immortal concept. So intrigued by pain are those of my kin that in a few cases of possession that you may have read about or seen popular B-movies produced about, we actually try to harm ourselves just to feel it. Like I said, peaks and troughs. No, hell is altogether quite different. It's even worse for my kin. I was the first and therefore was given the duty of leading others here, a task I do all too well. Nevertheless, I still feel its effects. Yes, even Satan is bound by hell. Let's start off at the beginning. You die. Normally, if you'd led a good life, you would appear before him. He would send you off on your next adventure on a higher plane of existence, one that is alien to me. But instead, you choose to live in the manner that we have. You would awaken in a few hours after being dead, in a room. This is, of course, a metaphor for the actual thing, but I am speaking to beings who barely have a working knowledge of their own plane of existence, so you will forgive me if I dumb this down a bit. As I say, 
you will be in a room completely cut off from any other manner of interaction, any other entity. You will be compelled before too long to try and communicate with somebody else, searching for something else to do apart from merely existing. Time will suddenly lose all meaning to you, as it does to all who are immortal. Even the ticking of the clock is a distraction, and hell has no time for distractions if you'll pardon a truly awful pun. You'll feel like you should be getting desperate in your search, but that feeling will not be present. In fact, no feelings shall be present, none. You will be an emotionless husk of your former self. Now, before long, you will learn to fake emotions in order to try and bring some sanity to this mad place, but your heart of hearts, you will know that these half-hearted attempts do not fill you. You continue your ever-questioning search. Lifetimes go by. You no longer stop, but continually search for something else, anybody else, to talk to, to interact with, to belong with. Just when you are about to give up the search, you will find somebody else in that same room with you. In fact, you will find everyone else, all of us, who have been damned to hell. And we are all precisely like you, emotionless dregs of spirit, merely combinations of particles forming souls that no longer have any purpose. You will not take joy in your victory, not even the half-hearted kind. Being with us is no different really than being by yourself. The conversations you will have with them will be no different than the conversations you had in your own mind. And then, you will wait. The last purpose of your existence was to find those who had been damned like you, and that last hint of a normal existence has been snuffed out for eternity. So you wait. You will wait and wait for some hope or some happiness. At that point, were you capable of it, you would be so mad that you would even accept never-ending torture as a preferable alternative. This is where we exist. This is hell. Never-ending nothingness. Once in a while, through mortal design, we are allowed to return to your world, never quite to interact physically, except to those foolish enough to open themselves up to possession, but enough to witness. And we've been in that place for so long now that we can remember what it's like to feel again. All we can feel is hate. Hatred for you people and your pointless, idling lives, the way you sit at your computers and on your phones for hours at a time, consuming so much and giving back nothing. And that true hatred comes from the fact that even that existence still has more meaning than our own. God gave mortals the ability to call us out of hell. Whenever you hear a demon summoning, the mortal is the offender. They are the ones who rip us out of that existence, but only enough to see what we will never be able to have again. Only enough to see what we have failed to do, never giving us the power to do anything about it. Never giving us the power to do anything about our miserable state in life. Even if there is a possession, that gives one of us at most another 80 years. But compared to an eternity, 80 years is a blink to us. And that is why we are called demons. It's from the Latin daimonium, which means lesser spirit. That is all we are. Lesser entities. Struggling through eternity for more. For anything. And that, dear listeners, is what hell is. Living forever, not in torment, but in worthlessness. <laughs>